Hi, welcome everyone to our live stream, which I hope is now streaming for you. Um, we thought we'd do a quick introduction of everyone who's going to be in here. So my name is Nila de Meira and I'm the psychology, um, well, what am I? The coordinator for undergraduate admissions uh, in psychology and I coordinate EP and PPL, so shortlisting and admissions. So with us today, we've got uh, several of our students. So Milena, um, who's a third year in psychology and philosophy. Eljo, first year in experimental psychology. Jamie, second year in philosophy and linguistics. Corin, third year experimental psychology. And then we've got Dave Leal, who coordinates admissions for philosophy. And Louise Mycock for linguistics. So um, I'm going to put this on speak of you so that whoever's answering a question will be in the highlights um, and move away from this thing. Okay, great. So we thought we'd address some of the questions that have been answered, asked to us in the Slido. And we also want to kind of say, please do keep asking us questions and keep upvoting the questions you want us to answer because we'll pick them from there uh, rather than anywhere here on YouTube. Um, we'll also keep this session afterwards so you can watch it afterwards and we're going to repeat the question so you can just watch this on its own. Right, so the first question that we get asked all the time is, do we need work experience and do you want us to talk about our work experience in our personal statements? And the very short answer is no. So psychology on its own or any of the combinations, we are not a vocational degree, we are an undergraduate scientific degree as forming a basis for potentially you to go on to a, a vocational degree if that's what you want. But similarly, this is about the science and the, the theory. So the short answer is no, you do not need work experience. We also know from experience that if you happen to have work experience shadowing a, a clinical psychologist, that's, that's really not typical because most of the time these people won't allow under 18s to come and sit with them. So if you do have it, often it's because obviously you know someone. So um, this is not a requirement whatsoever. It's probably the short answer. And I'll, I'll let uh, Louise for linguistics talk about um, work experience requirements for linguistics um, and then Dave for, for philosophy, but Louise first maybe. Well, I mean, work experience for linguistics, speak a language, English counts. That's absolutely fine. Uh, you're already uh, running, uh, up and running as a user. So uh, linguistics, we know we're realistic. It's not something that people study at school. So we know that you're basically coming to us from a kind of uh, uh, an, uh, an interest in linguistics, but not uh, an understanding uh, that you would gain from any other kind of subject. So no work experience necessary, apart from being a speaker. All right, Dave for philosophy. Well, in philosophy, if I tell you that when I first suggested to my head teacher at secondary school that I was planning to go for philosophy and he told me I'd never get a job. Um, and my wife certainly would say I've never had a proper job. But anyway, I've, kind of work experience really isn't a thing for philosophy at all. The only degree in the whole university that actually does uh, think about work experience at all is really medicine. Uh, none of our degrees are bothered about work experience. Schools, we know, sometimes obsess about work experience and about the work experience you've got, but we really are just uh, marketing academic degrees and we want you to be academically the very best you can. And we want that to be where your energies are going. Excellent. Yeah, so I think we're all on the same line on this. I think if you've got something that you want to talk about in your personal statement and you have done something that you think might be related to psychology, please do talk about it. It's nice for us to hear about your experiences, but also about how you reflect on those experiences. And in some cases that could be just, you know, being part of a volunteer group or whatever it may be. It's more about what you do with the thinking about your experience and your reflection than any particular experience you may or may not have had. Um, and you could just as well get that out of a book or having watched a really interesting film or a, a, a listen to a podcast. It can be anything that kind of triggers uh, some of those thoughts. Okay, so question two. Uh, that we're going to address here now is which part of the application matters the most? Uh, is it the TSA? Is it the personal statement? Is it the predicted grades? Is it the reference or the interview? Um, and I think the short answer is they all matter and to different degrees um, for different stages. But I'll ask Dave maybe to start by addressing some of this and then I'll, I can come in. Okay, so the, um, it's quite right. They all matter, but the uh, we can very quickly say that for 
the purposes of Oxford admissions personal statement matters least. And it matters least because we, unlike other universities that you're applying to very probably, will be having a chance to meet you in different ways uh, that are slightly under more controlled conditions. And we so we set you a test. Um, if we like what's gone on in the test and what's on the UCAS form, we'll invite you for interview. We'll actually get to meet you. And that can do a lot of the job that the personal statement would be the only thing doing that job for other universities. So the personal statement probably for us matters least. It's the thing over which you probably have the most con immediate control. So it may feel to you like it's a thing that matters enormously, but actually of all of these elements, it's the one that probably has the least significance for us. Then as hinted, it will depend what stage of the process we're thinking about. Uh, the interview obviously doesn't matter until it's happened. So if you're going to get an interview, you need to do well in the other elements that have been mentioned. So you need good predicted grades, you need good GCSEs in the context of the school they've been taken in. So it's very important always to remember that we're looking at all of the things we look at in the context of the education you've had. We know which school you took either GCSEs or middle year IB or whatever existing qualifications you've got, we know where that happened. Uh, and we know where you're taking your A-levels or IB or advanced hires or whatever it might be. So we've got a pretty good sense of the context you're doing things in. We look at those grades. The school reference is important, especially if there are any non-standard things going on that we would need to know about. So many school references are just um, peons of praise to the person who's applied and they look very much like each other. They obviously, we don't want something that uh, says you're a psychopath more than three or four times. If it says that, then we'd be a bit worried. But other than that, good school reference, yeah, that's a tick. A school reference that says that you've gone through particular hardship, maybe illness of a family member, you've been looking after them, caring for them, concerned about them, that kind of thing makes a huge difference to us because it helps us to really authenticate something about your um, history to get to this point. So the school reference can be enormously important if the school reference is just simply saying how good you are at your academic subjects, and we can see that on paper, it won't add very much, uh, but it will give us a slightly more rounded sense of who you are. So predicted grades, if you're not predicted the grades to get in, that's essential, right? So that's going to lose you the chance of an interview. But if you are predicted the right kind of grades, then we're going to be looking at everything else in the round. The important co question, important issue all the way through is context, context, context. We're looking at everything together and you in the context of, for example, your school. Once the interviews have happened, though, everything still that we've looked at before remains live. So if there was anything in your school reference that said anything about the context of your qualifications, we don't forget that at that point, that still is part of what we're looking at. If your interviews have been terrific, but we still maybe had doubts about something in some other aspect, then those doubts might remain and we might sort of still look at everything together. Once the interviews have happened, it's not only the interview then, but the interview and everything else that we have seen that comes together to help us to make our judgment about whether you should be made an offer. Uh, Nilo, is there anything yep. to add to well, that? Uh, I was going to ask Louise if she's got anything to add. I can add a little bit, but um, maybe Louise first. I think the only thing um, that I would add is that reinforcing what I said earlier, we know that people don't study linguistics at uh, school. So um, I take the whole picture into account as, as Dave's already clarified, but I would like as well to see some mention the personal statement of why linguistics, what it is that has drawn you to this subject, which you won't have been introduced to in a very uh, kind of explicit way within your school studies. Yeah. Yeah, so I also agree completely with Dave, and um, Dave and I have been doing this for a while together. Um, we work on the shortlisting and stuff together. Um, the one thing, again, maybe to really emphasize is, yes, the interview matters, but it is definitely not the final filter. We have admitted people who've not done great in interview, but who've done really well on all the other elements. So it, it's definitely, you know, not everything up to then just gets wiped. So I definitely want to emphasize that bit because I think people get so obsessed with this interview as if it's the end all and be all and it's just another element. Uh, Dave you want to say something? Yeah just, yeah, just to, to 
emphasize what Louise has um, said about linguistics. That's true of actually all three subjects. So I would guess psychology will be the one that more people have studied of the three than any, but you don't have to have studied psychology before. Um, as philosophers, we're most keen that you're doing sort of quite sharply analytical things. So if you're doing maths or sciences or um, subjects like that, that's terrific. You don't have to be doing philosophy. So for all of us, the personal statement is the opportunity to say a little bit about what's got you onto this kind of path, what's made it the case that you've applied for this. Um, but you could have all sorts of motivations, watch the television program, read a book, something got you into it there's no right answer to this at all yeah i think this actually brings us very nicely onto the next question that i was going to ask this somebody asked should i be aiming for a balance in the, my personal statement between different areas of psychology or focus on an area that i prefer and i think this is again where this comes in this personal statement should really be yours and as as dave has said before we don't rate it that highly definitely not in shortlisting because basically the, the, the crux of it is that we don't know who wrote it, right? It could be anyone who wrote this. So your personal statement, if you can, should really be personal. We would want to see what is it that you particularly like. So you should not be aiming for some sort of wonderful balance or some sort of specific formulaic answer in your personal statement with one paragraph on this, two paragraphs on this, you know, these kind of formulas that we know you get given by your schools, uh, but really try and make it about you. What is it that you like? So in that question about, should you be aiming for a balance across areas? No, you should go for what interests you and tell us about what you um, think is, is fascinating or what is motivating you to do, uh, to choose this course. So we do want to hear about you. Um, much more than we want to see a beautifully written story and um, that's been edited to the hilt um, so that's that's that bit on personal anything else on personal statements or are we done with personal Donna, can i just jump in there yes for go example, please I just say that i applied for philosophy and linguistics at oxford but i had to apply for very different courses at very different universities because it's not offered by many universities so in terms of that what i did was that i wrote about i wrote about an essay i wrote for philosophy I wrote about uh, an EPQ that I wrote on linguistics, but I, how that related to philosophy as well. But to be honest with you, Oxford takes into account that, especially with courses like PPL, they're not offered at many other places. So we understand if you're not able to like tailor your personal statement to the Oxford course. Um, so I just encourage you to kind of like think about the overlap between the subjects if you're if you're worried, like I was, about how to get philosophy and linguistics in when I was applying for sole philosophy courses elsewhere. Yeah, that can definitely be an issue with some of the joint courses that may be not offered. So Louise, have you got anything to add? You, because you probably know that, you know, they will have second and third universities that maybe are purely one of the other subjects. Absolutely. Um, and we see this a lot as well, particularly um, the other thing that you can do with linguistics is a modern language. Um, quite often <coughs> people might just be applying for the modern language. So I look for mention of it, but I'm a realist. Yeah, you are preparing one statement that's going to do the job for possibly different courses because you not everywhere does linguistics. So I would like some sort of mention of, of why you're interested in language. I'm, you know, it, I'd like to at least see some indication of that. But also I appreciate that you're not going to put in your statement, I want to do linguistics, blah, 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 if that's not a course that you're applying for across the board. So I'd like some indication of interest and mentioning things like a project or an essay that you've written that is possibly related to the other side is, is, is a great way to, to achieve that. But, you know, a simple statement saying why you have an interest, particularly in language, which, you know, with, with any of the courses is, is probably something that you can smooth into your, um, into your personal statement that will work very well. Yeah, could I add to what Jamie said earlier as well? Yeah. Um, so I did a very similar thing where I um, basically had to apply for many different courses across different universities. So um, my personal statement actually was based around um, neuroscience. So what they were talking about, um, do you have to add like social psychology bio uh, and like neuropsychology and things like that? So mine was mainly fo focused on neuropsychology. So you don't have to add like every aspect of psychology you find interesting. So may, uh, maybe try to like focus it specifically to, to one that you're more interested in. Great, um, yes. So shall we move on to the next question? So this is the question about what are the main things to consider between when deciding between PPL and EP? 
I think this is quite a tricky question because we can all, you know, I'm sure Louise can, can tell you about how wonderful linguistics is, I can tell you how wonderful psychology is, and they can tell you about how wonderful philosophy is. So I think your interest is probably the main thing that should guide you, whether you want to have more emphasis on uh, psychology purely or whether you want to do a combination. Uh, but maybe we can talk to, um, yeah, let's, let's hear from Dave. Uh, okay, so the, the question has a bit of background as well, because the person who's asked it is saying that um, he or she has more of a humanities background and is thinking from that perspective about PPL versus EP. So um, as a philosopher, I just want to emphasise that it's if you're interested in psychology, but you have a humanities background, psychology doesn't become less experimental or less scientific just because you have a humanities background. You're applying for a science subject. If you're applying for, uh, so philosophy in Oxford is always philosophy and something else. And if you're applying for philosophy and maths, the maths doesn't go away. If you're applying for philosophy and physics, the physics doesn't go away. In fact, in some ways they get harder because you're just, you're doing two things at the same time. And the psychology is to the same depth as it would be if you were doing experimental psychology. You're just doing a narrower range of subjects within psychology. So how to decide? Well, yes, absolutely. Think about what most excites you, what is most drawing you towards these subjects. But there is a danger with a joint degree between philosophy and a science that it can look like the combination of the two is going to end up with the um, the science being a little bit sort of armchair or at arm's length and not being taken as directly or scientifically as it would be if you were just doing that subject. That's not true at all. Um, and the, a purely humanities background uh, with particularly if that's you've been drawn to that partly because you don't like science or you're not so good at maths, that would be a problem for philosophy, actually, as well as it would be for uh, psychology. Uh, linguistics is unusual in uh, being a humanities subject. Um, hopefully, Louise can say more about this, but actually does experiments. It actually has um, scientific experimental dimension to it as well. So I would say to somebody who asks this question, think about where your interests really lie. If they are in language and language development and questions like that, then psychology and linguistics is terrific. That's an excellent degree. If they're about the, uh, the structure and the uh, function of language, then it could very well be that philosophy and linguistics is the right kind of route. So there could be PPL routes that are perfect for you, but there's an awful lot of science here. And if that's what you're trying to avoid, either of the degrees, PPL or EP, are probably the wrong thing. Louise, I think you probably next. Yeah, I, I, was, I was nodding away there. Um, <laughs> linguistics is kind of, I mean, we play well with other children. We do have a foot in each camp, which is why the PPL degree is so nice and so perfect. It's so interesting when I get those people together to teach them together in a tutorial, particularly with the modern languages people coming in as well. So we, we sort of sit in the middle there. But it's certainly true that, you know, there is an experimental dimension. I speak as a woman who spent uh, the last week counting a lot of numbers from corpus data relating to British English. Um, and that's actually reflected in uh, the course structure right from the get go, to be honest, because in the first year prelims um, course, you'll take, uh, if you're doing linguistics, you'll do linguistics, the other P from the PPL kind of thing. And what we um, uh, strongly recommend people do, I, I, and I think this is, is basically the default, is that the other course they'll take in the first year is the introduction to uh, probability and statistics as well. So the maths is, is baked in from the beginning there. And there's a good reason for that, because as Dave's already said, uh, linguistics does have this kind of humanities background as well, but there are plenty of people, students and also um, uh, colleagues of mine who are doing quantitative research in linguistics. So, you know, we have psycholinguistics options. That's a perfect kind of uh, middle point between the psychology and the linguistics. Um, but, but also we have uh, lots of people doing corpus studies, uh, even, even on ancient languages as well. So it's, uh, I would definitely say a foot firmly in each camp, which is of course why you find linguistics in different places at different universities. Sometimes it's in the humanities, sometimes it's in the social sciences. We sit bang in the middle. So it, it it's not an escape from uh, from the social science side of things at all. Great. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to move on. So one of the questions um, slightly maybe related is about 
the amount of scientific background that's needed. So we've been asked, um, you know, will it disadvantage me in an in interview if I haven't done as much science? Will it disadvantage me once I'm on the course if I haven't? And I think for me, the answer for that is very much, um, it, for interview, we expect no prior knowledge. It's very clear that the way we set our uh, questions for interview is that we provide you with the material and it's not going to be a question like, you know, some, some question you might see in an A-level or GCSE exam, specifically trying to ask you about content or about knowledge. So we, we don't do that. Um, once you're on the course, you'll find that different people have done different things. So there is no set background required. Um, similar for philosophy and linguistics and psychology. We don't say you have to have done X. We just say it would be very helpful if you've done some science and math because the course is a scientific one and it will build on that and it'll, you'll need some of this. Uh, that said, it could have been anything. It's more the way of thinking rather than a specific subject knowledge. Um, and what happens in prelims is that you take three different prelim courses and some people who may have done biology say might find neurophysiology slightly easier and some people who may have done lots of maths might find stats slightly easier. But once you're on course, the whole aim of that prelims is to bring everybody back up to the same level so that we can start start the course. So this kind of background idea and people come from varied backgrounds and we're very, very used to it. And um, that's probably the thing to say there. Does anyone want to add anything? Jamie? Yeah, I was, was going to I was gonna add something, which is that um, when I, so I applied with three humanities A-levels and no science, no maths. Uh, and I was dead scared, quite frankly, um, because he said on the, you know, it says on the website, oh, it's useful if you study the science or maths. But I think uh, one of the questions we've received is what advice would you give to future applicants or your younger self? I would say, take it at its word. They're useful. They're not required. You're not going to get rejected primarily because you haven't taken like um, three sciences or something. So I was really scared about that. And also I did statistics and it didn't hinder me at all that I only had a GCSE in maths. I found it really fun and I, I was fine with it. Um, shall I move on to the next question? Does anyone want to add anything? Yeah. So the a question we get asked a lot, and I think um, as as course coordinators, um, we we put our hat on a, a, in charge of many colleges. Is how to choose a college. So people have asked: Is there any colleges that specialize in psychology more than others? Is there particular areas that people colleges are uh, specialized in? Um, and I think the main thing to say here, maybe also from student perspectives, is that you will have tutorials in many different colleges, right? So it's not that that one college will be where you receive all your tutorials. So whoever's the tutor there is the main person you will see forever. Um, that's definitely not the case. So typically um, in psychology, what you get is in the prelims, often that's done in house. So tutorial teaching in the first two terms are, is often with the tutors in college. But once you're past that first year, you go everywhere, right? So wherever that tutor is based for your second year or your third year courses, wherever they're specialized in, that's where you go and have tutorials. So your choice of college shouldn't really have too much to do with um, what kind of tutors are there and what they specialize in because you'll get taught across. I mean, it may be one of the factors along with many other factors that decide which college you choose. Um, so, and probably the final thing that I would say before I hand over to someone else is that it's just also a preference, right? So you get interviewed in two colleges, you may well not end up in the college that you express the preference for so you know don't don't think of it as as the most important thing um in determining what kind of subjects and what kind of uh, stuff you'll be doing for psychology um, maybe linguistics and philosophy and maybe some of the students want to come in and say something as well yeah for linguistics i think it's um maybe a little different in that not every college admits for linguistics so you need to check to see that the college will admit for linguistics um any college that admits for linguistics has a linguistics organizing tutor um but they won't necessarily be a tutorial fellow so it may be that you are um you're not taught completely in-house for the first year uh, prelims course, which is already uh, mentioned, uh, if you go to a particular college. I am a tutorial fellow in a college, so you will see me every single week for the whole of the first year. Um, but that may vary. We are a small subject, but perfectly formed. So we uh, often find that um, 
things may be a little bit more centralized than in other cases, uh, but you will still be taught in a college, you know, the, wherever you were taught, somebody will have a college association and any college that admits for linguistics will have a linguistics organizing tutor that will help you, advise you, make sure that your teachings are set up in advance and, and deal with any issues that you've got with the linguistics side of the degree. So Aljo, maybe you want to say something because you you arrived in a different college. So how did you pick colleges? Yeah, so um, I uh, chose or I applied for Worcester College um, uh, at the start, but then I got pulled to uh, Pembroke College. And so my main thought process when applying for a college was literally um, what are the grounds like? What is the place like around it? And Worcester, yeah, I'd, um, if, oh, unfortunately, yeah, people won't be able to directly visit but if you look online it has one of the best um uh, grounds of of the colleges they have like huge um fields they have a really nice pond and yeah i just i just thought it was a really good place to apply um so that's one of the things that i really emphasize for my um college like choice that, but there are other things you have to consider such as like if you want like a gym so worcester i think also has a gym available whereas pembroke doesn't but I what one thing that I didn't take into account as well is like how close they are to my lectures and Pembroke was actually I think a little bit closer and thankfully it kind of worked out and I did really enjoy like going to Pembroke and also the people at Pembroke are, are just really really nice so at the end of the day even if you apply for a specific college and you don't get in for that college I think that all of the colleges are really nice to be honest and um you, you won't go wrong it, it, so it's not a really, really big decision, but it, it is, you know, yeah. a choice that you, you can make, or if you don't, if you can, if you don't want to, you can just put in a open application as well. I think this is where social psychology actually comes in quite strongly. So there's a very strong in-group preference. <laughs> wherever you end up being, you, that becomes your in-group and you become very, very associated with that college. And whether that was the one you applied to or another one, you, you end up feeling that your college is definitely the best. So I think best. that happens <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> so um, social psychology at work there. Jamie, yeah, you I, was gonna, I was just going to add, um, don't, I wouldn't choose by which tutors are at your college because, quite frankly, they can change. So the tutors who are at the college I applied to, which is Jesus, which is where I'm studying, um, and who interviewed me there, were not there when I arrived in first year. And then the tutors I had in first year were not there in second year. So uh, if I'd been chosen on that basis, I would have been very disappointed. And secondly, since, I, since prelims for my finals, I've done six modules and four of those were taught outside of college. So again, if I'd chosen on the basis of the tutors in my college, I would have been very disappointed. So I would, I would, I would recommend not doing it on that basis alone uh, and thinking more about the, the kind of community. Yeah, excellent. So a question that's come through for, for us a few times now as well is um, what's happening with the TSA in the context of the pandemic? Will it be sat everywhere? Um, this is something I don't think we know. We are going currently from the assumption that it will happen and we will have a TSA um, and we're clearly monitoring the situation. Um, Dave, do you have any anything more to say except for we are assuming? Well, yeah, we're, we are assuming um, in the UK uh, it's been announced that uh, with A-levels having been very different this summer that there will be an autumn round of examinations. We haven't had any details about how A-level exams will go but I assume if it's thought to be safe for A-level exams to happen in the UK then at least in the UK it should be safe for the various admissions tests to go ahead as well. Um, Around the world, it's just going to depend on questions of gathering, of travel. Uh, in some places, it's going to be extremely difficult because there will be relatively few centres to go to to take the test. And it may very well be that travelling across state boundaries or across international boundaries isn't going to be possible from some places. But we just cannot know that yet. So we're proceeding on the basis that um, all of this is just going to happen in the ordinary way. Uh, because that just seems that pragmatically at the moment the right thing to do, but we do not know and we can't have any guarantees. Yeah, uh, we get asked a lot about how to prepare for TSA as well. I think we've covered that quite well in uh, the interviews with the students, so I thought I'd just mention it here as well. If you haven't watched those other videos, 
Um, there's quite a lot uh, in the interview with students on how to prepare for TSA exams um, and what to do for the testing. Dave might want to add something there as well. Well, just to add, because I did write a few things on uh, doing the essay, that if you go to the admissions website for the degrees and look at the, uh, the little panel on the tests and look at the panel on the TSA, then there is a panel on preparing for the test that should have some links to past papers, which is both the multiple choice, of course, and the essay questions. But there are some uh, guidance notes that aren't uh, essays, but are suggestions of things that might go into essays to get you thinking. So one thing you might do is look at the essay that the guidance notes are about, think about it, think about what you might include in an essay, think about the relative importance of different things, then have a look at the guidance notes and see how that either, how your notes are better than them, which they might very well be, or um, how those notes help you to sharpen what you want to say. So there are some helps for the essay, um, the multiple choice things, there are plenty of opportunities to, to have a go at those tests do try them out because the speed you need to get through the multiple choice bit at is sufficiently um, up tempo that knowing the kind of pace you've got to work at is really very important. I don't know if the students could say anything. So Jamie, you will have taken that yeah, test. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so when it comes to the multiple choice, uh, as Dave says, I'd strongly recommend a few practice papers, getting that internal sense of pacing it's, I think it's less than two minutes a question. So yeah. you do need to be quite rapid with that. And when it comes to the essay, um, yeah, I think look at the look at the page online and think carefully about how you're going to structure the essays. Um, those are the two tips I'd give. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. So we've had a few questions on the location of the department. Um, it's currently a temporary building. What's happening there and how close is it to different colleges and what's going on there? So I think I'll briefly address that. Um, so we are currently based on um, in New Radcliffe House. So it's on the Radcliffe Observatory Quarter in Jericho. Um, it is indeed a temporary location. So for those who, who don't know, our departmental building was closed due to asbestos. So we used to be on South Parks Road. So what's happening there is that a new building is being built. Um, it probably won't be there by next year <laughs> if you were applying this round, but it, you, might, you might see it arrive um, maybe towards the end. Uh, but in, in the meantime, we're in um, Radcliffe Observatory Quarter. It's not necessarily that relevant, I think, to most of the undergraduates because only really when you come to do your final year project, you spend quite a bit of time in the department working on your experiments and working uh, with a research group. But the other parts, the lectures and the tutorials, they're, they're not based in the department. So the closeness of department to college is probably a relatively small factor in your considering of which college you would like to go to. Colleges are also all really close. I mean, Oxford is really small. You can get from one end to the other end quite easily. Um, so uh, maybe it's nice to be able to just roll out of bed and stroll <laughs> 20 meters down, down the road. But nevertheless, uh, it's never really far. Um, but yeah, the, the department is going to be back into the science area and is currently in uh, Rat New Radcliffe House. And then Eljo is trying to say something. Yeah, I was just going to basically back it up and say that yeah definitely everything in Oxford is so close together you can just walk everywhere um in my first year I really thought that I needed to get a bike because I thought that oh I need to get to this place because it might be quite far but in, I, I didn't need a bike at all and I could get to wherever I needed to go just on foot and it was relatively quick, uh, quick maybe about 10-15 minutes from most places I guess so yeah definitely it's I, I, that shouldn't be that shouldn't have to be a consideration how close the department is how close is the linguistics department and does anything happen in linguistics departments louise things always happen in linguistics <laughs> 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 um we uh we're not far actually from where you're at the moment 
Uh, so there's a neat little triangle between uh, psychology, my college, and then linguistics is on uh, Walton Street, which is also not far from Worcester. But, you know, same as everybody says, it's not a big place and you can certainly get easily between um, areas. Some um, probably more of the smaller kind of second, third, fourth year courses uh, might take place in the linguistics centre. Um, others will take place in uh, the Taylor Institute because there's a larger hall there. So for example, a lot of the uh, prelims um, lectures take place there. But again, it's, it's kind of a triangle. It's, it, it's next door to the Ashmolean, which is why they have a sign on it saying, this is not the Ashmolean, please go next door. <laughs> so we're all really, it, it's a really kind of compact place. So you will, you will be uh, in different buildings for linguistics, um, but I, I don't think traveling between them is a big issue. Yeah, especially for PPO, you, you're a little bit all over the place. I mean, I had lectures in exam schools for philosophy, but also in the philosophy faculty. And then in linguistics, I was between the Taylorian, the linguistics faculty and the phonetics and phonology lab. And then for uh, statistics, I was uh, in the medical sciences division, and there were two different places every other week so I kind of got to see all of Oxford which is actually really nice and it's, it's good for your step count as well if there wasn't a day without getting 12,000 steps so uh, yeah I wouldn't base it necessarily on where you are because you're going to be going all over. Excellent. Um, questions just come in about how many um, EP students do we admit and I think this this kind of brings us to a relevant question about um, the relationship between EP and PPL in admission so we are admitting to EP and PPL PPL as one cohort. So there's not a set number of psychologists and EP or a set number of PPL places that we admit to. So it's it's considered as a as one joint cohort for applications for shortlisting and then also for placing. So it, it differs every year slightly. Um, in total, we make about a hundred offers um, across EP and PPL. Um, I can't remember how many, I, I have the numbers somewhere, I'll, I'll look them up, I'll, I'll add it to the chat, um, how many exactly we had this year. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a joint um, application process and it's a joint cohort, so there's not a fixed number. Um, maybe Dave or Louise wants to add or? Well, I mean, just to say that in theory, because of what uh, Neela has just said, we could admit 100 EPS or 100 PPLS, that's actually never happened. Uh, normally the balance is somewhere, I think around 60, 40, um, about 60 EPS and 40 PPL. Um, in principle, psychology, because it's a science subject with labs, is one of the subjects the university uh, in its regulations has a cap on the numbers for just simply because of sizes of labs. Lots of the sciences in theory have that, but in practice, it's never, ever been invoked um, as a, an issue. Um, and all of us are looking to admit the best applicants who apply. So, uh, you know, it's a competition for who's the best and if you've applied for psychology and linguistics, if you've applied for psychology, if you've applied for philosophy and psychology, you'll be in a competition with each other for who we think are the best candidates. And, and that's just um, what the subject Paul allows us to do. Yeah, so a related question uh, perhaps is, can you switch from EP to PPL or vice versa? And what does the process look like? Um, it, it's complex is probably the answer mm. to say, but people, have switched and people will switch, but it's not a, an easy, quick thing to just say, oh, I've done this, now I'm gonna switch. Um, so the, it is possible uh, after prelims to switch, uh, but not, um, yeah, there has to be a good reason, uh, if that makes sense. So I, I don't know what um, Louise uh, and Dave's uh, experiences of this. Um, I think it also differs slightly per college perhaps. It, it may do. I mean, the the complication for EP to PPL is that not all colleges take all PPL combinations. So you might be in a college, and Louise perhaps could say a bit more about this, where there isn't a linguistics tutor, but where there are a large number of EP students, and that would be uh, a more difficult uh, conversation. Um, no course transfer in Oxford from one thing to another is straightforward because the college has set its um, shape up on the basis of the number of people it has teaching its different subjects and whilst people do swap and make some quite interesting changes that are much more exotic than 
EP to PPL or vice versa. Um, at the start of the year, the college will have organized its teaching resource with a particular balance of students in mind. So it can't uh, just straightforwardly say, what would you like to do now? Um, on the other hand, having said that, there are changes that are within the Oxford system, you know, EP to PPL, philosophy and psychology. If we were confident that you would work very hard at philosophy and catch up, then you know, you'd have missed logic in the first couple of terms, and that could be a problem later on. Um, but if we were confident that you were going to work hard, I think that's the sort of transfer that most colleges would smile benignly on and say that's fine. Um, but, but Louise, I'm going to turn to you because linguistics is a subject not taken in all colleges, and I can imagine that sometimes that might be a limitation. Um, it might be. I wouldn't say it was totally impossible. Um, but in terms of transferring from EP to PPL, what I would have in mind there is the fact that um, potentially uh, you are quite a way into the first year having done zero linguistics. Mm. So it may be the case that uh, you, if you're quite far down that road, you might be asked to repeat the first year. Mm. So I think if you're going to make a decision you would um, be well advised to take the time to think about this now. So, you know, look around, read, as we've said, you know, we want you to be able to pursue what is of interest to you. And so take a look at the options, take a look at, at what's out there, um, find out about linguistics, find out about philosophy, and, and see if that is really where your interests lie. Because I would say that it's possible, um, but it's not a, a case of kind of, you know, a, a quick flick of the switch and, and this is a done deal. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the change from PPL towards EP, we, we've had a few times and um, it's maybe slightly more straightforward uh, because the main thing that you'll they, they, people struggle with is the lack of neurophysiology. So that's what you get in, in the first year um, EP that you would then not have had if you'd done a, a PPL degree first. So the neurophysiology um, forms a strong basis for some of our cognitive neuroscience courses and behavioral neuroscience courses. So again, you'd have to then work a fair bit harder to make sure that you kind of get that background up um, well enough to get to the part ones, but it's not impossible. So people have done, uh, but think beforehand, preferably about what it is that you want to do um, and, and have a good think now before you apply. Um, We've got a question um, here on how is the writing part of the TSA assessed by examiners? And so for EP and PPL, this is uh, not formally marked centrally uh, is something to say. So other courses will uh, centrally mark and, and add a point uh, to it and add that to the shortlisting. Um, so in our case, it's not, it's done in a more qualitative manner. So the essays are uploaded uh, along with your applications and, and the college tutors will look at them and some may have an informal marking system they use themselves or use it in a more qualitative way, but there's no formal marking of it, but it is looked at. I can assure you that people do look at those essays, um, but not in a standard way across the whole um, course applications. Um, Dave, you, you mark them for, for Brazenose. Um, I do. And uh, as you will know, I uh, chaired the committee that sets the question. So um, I'm one of the evil geniuses to blame for the questions that you see. Um, yes, I do mark them. And when people after they've um, applied and either been accepted and made an offer or uh, not made an offer, when they write in for a bit of feedback, I'm able to say a little bit about the essay. As a philosophy tutor, it's extremely useful for me to be able to see a bit of writing from you done under kind of controlled conditions, because um, your personal statement might tell me a little bit about how you write. But as was said earlier, we don't actually know who uh, was finally responsible for the phrasing of your personal statement, even if we can be confident that the content is yours. So it's a really good opportunity to see you writing connected prose. I would be extremely happy to see somebody applying for philosophy and psychology or philosophy and linguistics who done something like biology, chemistry and maths as their A-levels or as subjects they were studying at school. 
but then I don't have any very clear sense about what their connected prose, what their writing is going to be like. So it's a chance to actually do that. So as Neela says, it's a qualitative judgment, but it's a good and important one that actually expands our sense of your intellectual personality quite a bit. Um, and used in that context, I think it can actually be a very useful part of the whole process. Yeah, I'm going to take another question from the list, which is, is consumer psychology taught at all? And I think uh, it kind of points to a, a few other broader questions about what's different, perhaps in the EP course to other psychology courses. So the thing to say is no, consumer psychology is not taught. Uh, same with forensic psychology. So we are not an applied course and we do not do applied um, subjects very well uh, because what we see our undergraduate course as is a formal basis and a broad basis where you get the theory and the, the concepts that you need in order to then go and do those more applied things in a postgraduate degree. So go and do forensic psychology in a postgraduate degree or consumer psychology. So it's the course itself is much more fundamental than um, some other courses that may be out there on psychology where you do get maybe more of those apply things already uh, in your undergraduate. So we, we don't do that here is probably the, the, the main thing to say uh, on that. Any of the students want to add? Maybe, Corinne, I'm not sure if you're there. Um, you may have, have muted this whole thing, but I was just- Yeah, no, I'm thinking. here. Oh yeah, so third year mm -hmm. repeat. Um, so maybe you can say something about um, the nature of the course and how you think it might differ from some of the other psychology courses out there. Um, so I would say the fact that it's a really scientific course is really important. Um, so it's a focus on research and research design. Um, I would probably say the fact that clinical psychology is not a big weight in this course. And I think that's quite important for people to know. So you do psychopathology in second year. So you will st study a bit about mental disorders, etc. cetera. Um, but throughout the three years, it doesn't, it's not the largest weight there's more on the research side of it so i'd probably say they were the things that stuck out to me it's making it different yeah um so another question i'm just uh, looking at now is uh, would we be entitled to extra time on the tsa if we, we receive it for all other exams dave i think that's the case right absolutely so um when if you got an offer and came to Oxford, we would then have a new assessment for university exams here. But if you get extra time in your school, then whatever extra time you get, that's it. So if it's 10 minutes in an hour or 15 minutes in an hour, you get that same time uh, in the TSA because the TSA is very definitely two parts a 90 minute multiple choice part and a half hour essay part. Um, those it's not like you get two hours and then just get on with it and use the two hours so the 90 minutes would be extended and the half hour would be extended by whatever proportion you would normally have and equally any other special arrangement so uh it's quite possible that a lot more people will be typing um this year because a lot of exams will have been being typed um but uh it, you know normally it would be handwritten and in fact speaking personally I like the fact that the essay is handwritten because I think you think differently through the end of a pen than you, you do through a keyboard uh, but if you normally type your scored exams then you would type the essay as part of the TSA test um, you would use whatever regulations whatever uh, examination conditions you're used to and uh, hopefully are as comfortable as one ever is in exams comfortable with from your school context we're not wanting to change anything just for us at that stage yeah, yeah Jamie. i was going to say i i did have ex um no not extra time i had rest breaks because that's what i had at school. Okay. so i used my rest breaks in both parts of the tsa and the uh, and a, another one which is no longer happening yeah. So another question about um, how does your choice of PPL or EP impact your career possibilities? So I think this can only hint perhaps at the potential of doing a, a clinical psychology degree. That seems to be what, what 
to me what that question is about, which is brief, briefly to say that if you are doing a joint degree, as long as you do sufficient amounts of psychology, you, your degree will be recognized by the BPS, which is what you need in order to then go and apply for further clinical psychology. I think irrespective of the clinical psychology potential angle and the BPS accreditation, everything else, I think career possibilities are the same, whether you do EP or PPL. Um, yeah, Louise. Um, just to add to that, that um, it's linguistics is always uh, taught with something else at Oxford, but people do, if they've done PPL, you know, we have people going on to further degrees in linguistics, if that's what they find is their interest at the end of their career. So, for example, um, I know of PPLists who've gone on to uh, study forensic linguistics at postgrad level or specialise in linguistics at postgrad level. So it doesn't narrow anything. You're not kind of at a disadvantage because you haven't done, you know, kind of a, a pure linguistics degree from the side of linguistics as well great and philosophy yeah um so it, it's just to say philosophy in oxford is always a joint degree again there are eight different joint degrees with philosophy of which ppl um is counts as only one but really in a way is two because you can do philosophy with psychology or with linguistics um i think it's important to say every bit as much on the psychology linguistics axis as any of the ones involving philosophy, that if your eventual career strategy was to work in clinical contexts, in language, language development, something around there, then you won't have the breadth of psychology that EP will have given you, but you may very well have much greater depth in precisely those areas that are gonna become part of your clinical work later on. So it's going to depend on your career path within clinical psychology, but as long as half of your degree is in psychology, you will satisfy, as Nila says, the first basis, which is to actually get graduate membership of the BPS that will let you carry on towards clinical training. Um, and then it's the question of which area of clinical psychology or which area of professional psychology you might want to get into. But some of the joint degree parts might very well open up routes that would be better prepared for on a joint degree than a single on as well. Yeah. So there's a, a next question about gap years. I think we get asked that quite a lot as well, so it's probably worth addressing. So is a gap year disadvantageous? So there, I know there is definitely some courses in Oxford I would say, you know, um, well, actually, I'll give you the example from maths because I know very well from maths that they say, well, if you've not done maths for a year, that's actually problematic and it's, this is going to impede you. I think for psychology, for sure, um, we don't have that point of view. If you are uh, applying as a mature student or you're applying with uh, achieved grades and you're going on to a gap year and your grades have met those criteria, then actually in, in some ways it's quite good for us to know that those A-levels are actually achieved because um, you may probably know that often, um, well, maybe it's, it's worth saying this at this point. So often schools tend to over predict your A-level results. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that we actually over offer because we don't really do a lot of uh, clemency. Well, we actually do no clemency in psychology without any serious extending, um, extenuating circumstances because uh, we would prefer to take people that have made uh, the offer grades. Um, so related to that, if if uh, we know you, you're making the offer grades because you've already achieved them, that's actually can be a, a positive thing for you, especially if you think you're not sure you may or may not um, get those grades. I don't think we have any specific policy that we think um, people with uh, um, gap years are in any way worse off or better off than people without, but just a note on the A-levels. Yeah, Dave, come in. So... Um... I mean, what is worth saying is that if you were, you know, so if we're admitting 100 people and you're about the 99th person on that list and you're wanting a gap year, then it's we might ask ourselves the question, well, would you be as good as the marginal candidates in the next year? And the answer to that is you might not. We might have a really strong year next year and we might regret next year having given you the place now. If you're a strong candidate, if you're, let's say in the first, you know, people who we look at and we think, well, obviously you should get a place, then obviously you should get a place is something that we're going to regard as just as obvious next year as this year. And so we'll make you an offer and, the only consideration at that point, which is a consideration, is 
there are gap years and gap years. There are gap years that are used in constructive um, ways that might actually be might even be relevant to the degree, but certainly might be something that's intellectually constructive and will keep you thinking. And then there might be other ways of using a gap year that is just basically, I'm a bit bored with education after all these years and I want to go away and do something else. And that might tell us something about education and you that might make us nervous. If you're very good, gap years are fine, have a good project. In order to fill the gap year, we will ask you about that. If you are at the very margin, we are less likely to make you an offer if you are considering a gap year, just because next year we're going to have another load of people who are going to be assessing for the same places and they might be better than you. So it's, it's, you know, it's a disadvantage only to that extent. This is quite interesting because I hadn't taken it as that. So you, Dave was talking about applying for a deferred entry, whereas mm. I was thinking you would be applying for entry that year, but with an achieved grade. So those are two slightly different situations. So one is you're applying now, but you only actually want to start the next year. And I think in most cases we would say, just apply the next year. So you just apply for the round that you're going to go, take your gap year, apply with achieved grades. This applying for a deferred entry has all the issues that Dave was, was talking about where, you know, um, you do have to consider what, what would they be like next year in the next year's cohorts. So I think those are two separate things. Both are gap years, but one is deferred entry application and one is just applying for that year, but having done a gap year. Now, um, Milena's come on camera. Are you a gap year kind of gal? Um, I am. Right. I actually took, I took a gap year, started a different course and dropped out and then did another gap year and then applied <gasps> to Oxford. So I'm very much a gap year gal. Um, and I guess, at least for my college, uh, I know it's very normal for people to do gap years because uh, it's for people who are already 20, over 21 when they're starting. And we actually have a lot of people from uh, different countries where it's really normal to do a gap year. So like Danish people end up like, that's sort of, they have like government support. So a lot of people that end up doing gap years. Um, and I don't think it really affected the admissions process, but it's worth saying we did what uh, Nelly, Nelly just said. So we weren't applying for deferred entry. It's that you're obviously already have your grades, you've already taken gap years, and then you apply. Um, for someone who's not in that mature student position, but coming straight out of high, out of high school, I think it's just also worth mentioning that um, Oxford is three years of very intense work, something that you really like, but it's three years of very intense work. So if you have the option to do a gap year and do something in between like studying and then going on to further study, um, I think that would be a really good idea, but I guess as Nelly said, maybe it's worth applying once you have your grades rather than deferred entry. Um, so that's my thoughts on that. Thanks, Melina. Dave? Just yeah. a very brief um, comment on that to say, when you finished your degree, your first, your, your BA degree, at that point, not knowing what the world's going to look like or what position you're going to be in for applying for the next thing, that might also be a point where a gap year might become an issue. Um, gap years have their costs as well as their benefits. So think carefully about your trajectory. It can be that carrying on while you're in the swim of education, getting the BA and then taking a bit of time to reflect on where life is going could be the better life plan but you know everybody's individual and um you know all the things we've said need to be the things you take into account exactly yeah um i, I think i'll do a very pragmatic quick question um so there's people asking if they're doing four a levels do they get a specific um offer set for their four a levels and the, the answer is no um so we have a standard offer which is a star aa um, and so that fourth one uh, doesn't actually matter to us. Dave maybe wants to say something else. Well, yeah, I just wanted to say the only time when I have made an offer, and it wasn't EP or PPL, it was PPE, the only time when I have made an offer on four A-levels was somebody who was doing eight. And I wanted to concentrate his mind on half of them rather than the other half. Um, and uh, it, so it, it, but unless you are in that extremely unusual situation of stamp collecting A-levels, um, three A-levels is the standard offer. Exactly. So yeah, so that's probably, you know, having done a few of the Oxford Cambridge joint sessions, that's probably one of the things where we differ in. We don't make uh, custom offers or conditional offers, depending on what you are doing. We have the same offer 
for everyone, irrespective of which college, irrespective of um, which combination, it will be A star AA for three of your A levels. Uh, and you get to pick which three as well. So <laughs> we're not saying, ooh, it has to be these three, um, three of the four, if you're doing four. Um, this is mainly because there's a lot of schools where you can't, they, they don't allow you to take four. You know, we, we can't discriminate because oh, you, you've, you happen to be at a place where you're taking four. So now you have to do, you know, a different thing than someone else. So we're trying to very much equalize um, what is the offer uh, conditions for all. Um, I'm going to have another look. Um, wider reading. Um, is there a specific quota for each college uh, admitting students? So, um, yeah, maybe someone could take that and I'll look for the next question. Okay, well, um, colleges will have a quota that will map onto the subject pools typically. So, EP and PPL they'll have an ambition to admit a certain uh, number of EP and PPL students. Within EP and PPL, the particular combination philosophy and linguistics, the one that Jamie is doing um, and uh, Louise will be teaching people doing, some colleges have a special small number of places set aside for philosophy and linguistics. Uh, not all colleges who admit for philosophy and linguistics have places specially set aside. My college uh, um, admits four at the moment for EP and PPL. And you know, it, we could admit four EPS, we could admit four, we could in principle admit four in philosophy and linguistics, though we never have done. Um, normally it would be some mixture of the two. Um, Louise, your college does admit for philosophy and linguistics and I think possibly has had places set aside for that, has it in the past? Yeah, I mean, flexibility is key here because, as I said, play well with other children. I've also got another kind of dimension, which is the modern languages and linguistics people, and they can be doing French, they can be doing Russian, they can be doing Spanish, they can be doing German. And um, nominally, my aim each year at Somerville is to admit six, but I'm very pleased that there's flexibility in that because it's all about taking who are the best candidates. So within that six, um, I have to correspond with uh, my psychology and my philosophy colleagues, uh, but also my modern languages colleagues. So there is a degree of flexibility there. Nominally, we'd maybe be expecting, you know, kind of two modern languages, two psychology and linguistics, two philosophy and linguistics, but that's not a hard and fast rule. We are looking for the best linguistics candidates who also are highly rated the best candidates for the other side of the degree, the other subject. Yeah, so often colleges will have um, a number of places and they're often joined, so there'll be uh, four places for psychology, they could be, so for, for example, in a few of the colleges, they could be taken up by four EP or by three EP and one PPL or by two EP and two PPL, and it may differ every year. So there is, in a sense, there is some quota overall to the joint degree, and then there is um, a few special cases of philosophy and linguistics that most of those four places are um, flexible, whether they get filled by EP or PPL. So... Um, one uh, really hard question I thought was, what are the qualities of the best candidates? Um, it, it's very hard to put it down into words, but I'm, I'm going to get Dave to start answering and <laughs> I'll take a minute to think myself. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, the best candidates are interested. And by that, I mean, they are interested in actually being here doing the subject. They're not interested in three years time, having the degree, walking away, with an Oxford BA, the, they are the people who want to be here because they're so excited by the opportunities, the intellectual opportunities the degree presents, that the best candidates are those. And frankly, that could trump, you know, four A stars at A level, somebody who's got an A star and two A's and who really, really is excited by the subject may very well be the person who ends up doing best by the end. So that's that's one thing what you've applied for, we want you to be excited by that. Um, the Beyond that, um, you know, if it's a question of what we can see on the UCAS form, then I want to see evidence of serious analytical ability. I think for all three of the PPL subjects, the capacity to think clearly, to classify, to 
uh, work out um, how an argument is structured, things like that. For all of us, that's going to be important. Um, so it, it's there are certain abilities, skills, if you like, that could have been picked up from different subjects at school. Um, chemistry is a very good indicator for philosophy. It's a rather better A-level indicator than A-level philosophy. It's for philosophy at university. So I can tell some of those things from your form. Um, but what we do have with the opportunity to meet people at interview is the opportunity to actually gauge how excited you are to not, I mean, I said somewhere on a, a video I did for another subject that coming in with, you know, a fixed grin on your face to show us just how excited you are. That's not what we're about. What we want to do is to see you really engaging with the questions we ask. If you do that, the time in the interview will just fly by. And at the end, you will wonder where the time went because you've been so engaged with it. That's a really good sign to us. Neela, that's bought you a bit of time. What do you think? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to monitor the questions and this. Yeah, yeah so I, I completely agree. I think that the UCAS form tells us quite a bit. Um, typically, we would be the same in psychology. We would be after those analytical subjects. Um, but there's always exceptions. So that's definitely the case uh, to, to mention. And it's, it's not... Um, that that's that makes everything but if you're asking in general you know what are the kind of qualities we're looking for it's good science background and then it, when it's when we get to doing uh, the interview it's this for me it's often this kind of quick thinking quickly picking up on things moving with you going you know going on this discussion together and this enthusiastic engaging that Dave is talking about for philosophy it's the same in, in psychology it's this this kind of quality when you're doing an interview that you can just feel that they, you know, you're giving, you're giving a little bit and they just take it and fly. And, and that's when you go, yes, that's what I'm after. But again, that said, I have had people who've done really, really badly in an interview, but who've had all the other markers, excellent grades from, from schools that would not be expecting to have that kind of grades. And we've admitted them and they've had a great time. So it's definitely not all about the interview. I don't want to say that. Uh, but when you're asking for those qualities, it's that kind of quick, quick interaction and the, you know, this, this, you know, enthusiastic participation that does kind of, you know, really you know, take you over the line and say, yeah, this is great. <laughs> Louise. Same for, yeah, same for linguistics as well. So, you know, sound like a broken record here. But um, what I'm looking for is, is, is that passion why why is uh, linguistics grabbed you you know i don't expect you to come armed with all the terminology and so on um you know we'll take care of that over the next three years that's what we're here for um but i want to see your interest i want to see uh you know that kind of uh, linguistics is a great one because you don't know what it is sometimes you don't even know that it's a subject it was a huge relief to me to find it was a subject because i was like that's it that's the bit i like i like the bit where you look at it and you kind of take it to bits and figure out how it's working and we want to see that kind of interest that kind of level of passion we don't need to you know you don't need to fire kind of terms and and, and stuff at me just show me that you're really interested and that will shine through you might have the fixed grin when you walk through the door we'll give you that because that's probably nerves but just you know be yourself and let that interest shine out and and that will be you know that will leave such an impression so yeah Jamie I gonna, yeah I was gonna add like uh there was kind of a myth among my peers when we were applying that you had to like the more you knew the better the applicant you were uh, I think it's important to know a little bit so that you know what the subject is and what you're applying for three years to study um but you don't need to know like loads. You don't need to know the entire subject. If you knew with the entire subject, there'd be no benefit in coming to study here and there'd be no benefit in Oxford teaching you. Um, so I think it's more about showing that you're able and interested in learning in this subject. Uh, there was like, one boy in my school who kind of used to show off about having read like a hundred philosophy books and everyone thought he was amazing and was going to get it. And he didn't get in because he clearly wasn't engaging with what he was reading and if he's read that much. I haven't read a hundred books in my degree so far um it's really about what you're reading really engaging and thinking about it and, and how you relate to that and what you find is a good argument and it's not a good argument uh rather than trying to just read as much as possible great um i think i'll move on to a, a actually burning question again relevant for the pandemic so we've been asked um what's going to happen with interviews 
um, what about international travel and what will these uh, interviews look like? So we can now actually say, and it's been announced that all interviews will be remote. So maybe we should have uh, started with that as one of the big information bits that we want to share with you. So all interviews for EP and PPL will be done um, over a video conference call. Um, so in that sense, it'll be the same for everyone. Um, and so people who are international and worried about travel, um, please don't be. We're going to try and, and, and fix it this way. Um, what those remote interviews will be like, we are very, very much wanting them to be very similar to what we normally do. So um, over the last term, having done quite a bit of um, teaching online and, and using uh, all manners of video calls for all manners of different ways, there's very good, we, we've all become quite good at sharing screens and sharing documents and uh, showing and even annotating during the interview. So um, they will be remote, but they sh will be in the same format in the same way that we've always done interviews. So when you look at the, there's a mock interview online on one of our pages. Um, so do have a look at that to kind of give you an idea of the, of the structure that we go through. Um, so that's still the plan. There's also a video of tutors talking about what they ask in interview. So have a look at that as well. Um, Dave, do you want to say anything extra on the remoteness? Well, it, just to say, because we have been asked on the um, chat, the questions come through, how will these um, differ? Um, it's possible because of the business of um, actually getting people together to interview and get them in a room that we might, it, colleges might do one slightly longer interview rather than a couple of shorter ones. Um, it, we don't know yet. Uh, but the actual content of the interview, the style of the interview will be as close to the way that we would interview in Oxford as we can make it. Uh, we've got a pretty good sense of what we're looking for and how we can uh, engage you in what we're looking for. So, uh, and we do already do online interviews. It's important to say that by the time uh, we are sending out invitations to interview what well, the time we have in the last two, three, four, five years, it's too late for some people to get a visa to actually come. So particularly to the Far East, um, we have often had to do a certain amount of online interviewing. It's something that all of us have done, um, perfectly used to. It is slightly more time consuming, which is why the, the, the length of an interview may vary a little bit and we might that might be an issue. Um, but otherwise it will be just the same. We might email you documents in advance uh, we might um, use a chat facility to send you some things to look at. Uh, and obviously, it will be very important for anybody who's being online interviewed not to share in any way until the whole process is done what the interview was like, because you are in a kind of competition with other people. It's something you will want to talk about with other people, but it's not something that um, is uh, you know, readily shareable without making the process more of a nonsense. Now, Malena, you are back and maybe you were remote interviewed, I'm not sure. Um, no, I was not. I was just um, going to say that, I guess I was thinking if I were an applicant and I mm. sort of had this thought of an Oxford interview and then I was told it was remote, mm. um, I might be wondering, well, how is that different? And um, I just sat my final exams at Oxford remotely. Um, so it was sort of a bit unnerving to think about how to do that. And I guess my advice would just be like, treat it as normal. Um, the best thing to really do is, um, yeah, you're, you won't have time to look anything up. Really, you won't be allowed to. And the kind of questions that are asked, especially in philosophy, I feel, aren't like, they're not going to be on Google. Um, so just sort of think and engage with the question and treat it like a normal thing. Um, and it's nicer maybe because you're in the comfort of your own home. So that's sort of my advice about that in general, moving from in-person to online, um, examining of some sort and interviewing, if that helps. You may be in the comfort of your own school because we do ideally like these things to be interviewed, but you certainly should be in familiar surroundings. Corinne. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm back. Um, yeah, to add to that, I, can, I completely agree. I think if you're sitting them remotely, then you just have to treat it exactly the same as regular exams. I found that that was the best thing because I also sat my finals here at home. So yeah, treat them completely the same. Great, so um, 
There's a question for the recent A-level students who have been given their A-level grades instead of sitting their exams. Is it preferred that they do sit their exams? Um, no, because it just won't be possible for many of them, right? So we will go with whatever exam grades we are going to get um, for the current people who've got offers holding at the moment. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't think there's much to say about this. I'm slightly worried, um, and, and I realize this is YouTube Live, but I'm on 7% and I didn't bring the charger for this laptop, so I may have to change to another laptop. <laughs> so if this all falls down, please everybody just log in again to the same yeah. thing and we go again. Um, it's only 15 more minutes, so we may just make it. Um, anyway, sorry to, to add that to the thing. But if it just crashes down, um, I'll fix it. Just, just hold, hold on. Um, right. Um, see some of the further questions. Um, how much of the course is in a lab? So uh, maybe, Corin, um, having finished your third year, you can say a little bit about uh, labs and practicals that go on in, in the course. Yeah, so in second year, you have a lab typically every week, and that's three hours long. Um, and that really varies. Usually it's um, computer based. So you would be in a computer suite um, working on an experiment. A lot of it is um, data analysis and research design. And then you have to write up a lab report based on, on that session. And then in final year, those skills that you learn are really important because you do your independent research project, which is, you know, one of the best parts of the degree, really, because all of that that you've learned throughout the three years comes down to you having control of doing some research. Um, so then that'll be working with a academic supervisor and then you have control of all of the of the parts of the, that research. Excellent. Anything? Um, so I'm um, imagine, Jamie, did you have to do any labs? Did you have labs in linguistics? Yeah, so I, I should say in philosophy and linguistics, we don't, uh, certainly the modules I've chosen has meant that I haven't really had any labs. I We did do phonetics and phonology in first year as part of prelims, and I had uh, 14 tutorials, I believe, for one hour in a lab, uh, and we did do some very kind of informal lab work, but I've never had long lab sessions, uh, and I won't be having them in my degree. That's just, that's a personal choice, but if you wanted to in philosophy and linguistics, you certainly could. I can say for philosophy and psychology, um, uh, yeah, um, I did the same as uh, Corin in second year, but for philosophy and psychology, you have approximately half of those labs. Um, and it's worth saying that it's quite, um, I've been told it's quite unique to the Oxford experience. Um, and there's really an emphasis that it's designed this way so that you get these uh, practical quantitative skills with like um, learning specific statistics programs and stuff like that. Um, and it can be a little bit grueling, but it's actually like incredibly useful um, and uh, for further study or any sort of like um, work later on. So um, yeah, I think they're a really good part of the degree. Yeah, well, whilst we're here, we've got the students talking a bit more. Um, one of the questions that I know is was one of the student experience ones, but I think it fits quite well on the course as well, is what's the workload like? Um, I think people are always wanting to know and I think you're, you're best placed to answer it. So Corinne, do you wanna go first and then? Yeah, um, I would say that the three years are all quite different because if you see that as first year giving you that foundation of study um, and then second year is exploring loads of options and then final year is is your advanced options I definitely saw that maybe in the final year my actual workload was probably less so in final year I would probably have an essay a week and then that would be it and then my research project in if we go if we go backwards in second year I would typically have one to two essays per week and then um, a problem sheet for stats. And then in first year, it was kind of the same, maybe two essays every week and then a problem sheet for stats. And so they would typically maybe like two tutorials per week in first and second year, and then one tutorial per week in final year. Yeah, so no, if you kind of see it as becoming more um, as self-directed, especially in the final year. Sorry, yeah, Jamie, if you have something to say. Yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, it's very different for someone who's studying philosophy and linguistics or the PPL course, perhaps. So psychology, I think, is slightly more structured, um, whereas philosophy and, linguistics, uh, philosophy and linguistics has certainly been more kind of independent and freeing. Um, so it really depends, like, even term to term, like, which modules you choose, how many modules you do, and year to year, and person to person, to be honest. But I always work on the assumption that I'm going to be doing about 30 to 40 hours of work a week whether that be independent or 
uh, independent work or contact hours? Um, yeah, to that. Um, so uh, I sort of tried to arrange it across my three years that I was doing like one and a half papers each term, which basically averages out <laughs> if you take all the days and all the deadlines you have is that I basically had a deadline like every four days. Um, so that gives, I usually ended up doing like two days of reading and then two days of writing um, for like a 2000 word essay, um, which is sort of just like the nuts and bolts of Oxford is you're just constantly producing these essays and you get a hang of it. Um, and in terms of the work uh, for philosophy and psychology, which is what I did, um, I was sort of doing philosophy um, like lectures and tutorials throughout three years, but because of how psychology is organized and you have some exams in second year, it really felt like my second year was very psychology focused because I had exams in that. And then my third year was very philosophy focused because in third year I had all my philosophy exams, which was quite nice actually, to sort of have one year to go more in depth into one subject and then the last year to go more in depth into the other subject. Um, so that was sort of how the work worked out, yeah. Um, so I might add about like coping with the workload. So obviously it's quite high doing like two essays a week and it's probably a step up for most people to go from maybe doing like an essay every month or an essay every two months, essay, uh, two essays a week. Um, so I would say that it's not, it's, it's manageable because you know that you're going to get that workload. So you know how to um, structure and to plan for those essays in advance. And you know this specifically the deadlines for those essays well in advance and you won't, it won't, they won't be uh, sprung upon you um, just like, oh, the day before, and then you have to uh, submit an essay for tomorrow. Th that, like, that has never happened to me in my first year and I hope it hasn't happened to you guys. Um, uh, so also, when you first arrive in Oxford, the you won't get given essays straight off the bat. One of my first assignments actually was to watch a documentary and it was not even a very long documentary. I think it was about 30, 40 minutes. And it's really interesting actually. And all it was is that we watch a documentary and then we discuss it in the tutorial. So that's basically um, one of the things that you do when you're, you're writing the essay is that you write the essay and you try to discuss that material in the tutorial. So um, when you write your essays as well, try to make it like not, not just covering the lecture content, but something that you're interested in. So you can like mention it in your tutorials and really show like the aspects you're interested in and something that, you know, um, is unique to maybe you yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want to go too much on a tangent, but in terms of your first kind of essays, I know my first essay, I had no clue and I was terrified of turning up to my first tutorial. And I think knowing that that will be a progression and as you get into your final year, that it's just so familiar and the way that you, you know, read and do your notes and everything will just become, you know, such a, a common thing for yourself. So yeah, know the fact that that's something that you learn as you go along. So don't put too much pressure on yourself for those first essays or etc because everyone kind of gets it wrong and then learns as they go along. Yeah I, I was also going to add to that um, that I think it's actually quite because how most of the Oxford degree works out for most people is that actually sort of the first one two or three years um, they don't actually count in terms of your marking like the third year is the main thing of marking like for psychology you have a little bit of it in your second year or some of it um, and while that can be grueling I actually think it's quite great because it allows you to just sort of learn and make mistakes during most of the years because it doesn't it doesn't count so it's quite good because it, you don't actually have to have so much pressure and it's really nice to have all these tutorials and essays where you can try things out and make mistakes and then by the time you get to the end or the build up at the end of second year or third year where it actually counts like you've had all this practice that um hasn't been important for your final grade and i think that can actually be quite helpful uh just as another thought to that i mean i i just as a I tutor's perspective it's it is true that when you get to oxford there's the sort of worry of just putting pen on paper just or or getting typed typing your first essay um i actually set the first kind of test first exam that my students do on the thursday of their first week before terms actually started a one hour thing and i just asked them some questions which are you know quite admissionsy kind of things um so one of them was uh 
if we lost the apostrophe from the English language, you know, thinking of all those kind of signs you see that have missing apostrophes, I suppose, if we lost the apostrophe from the English language, would anything serious be lost? Um, and just ask people to write about that for half an hour. Um, and the point of that is not, I mean, it probably is cruel and unusual punishment because I'm a philosophy tutor and that's what I specialize in, but it's really intended just to say, okay, we're here to think, maybe about things we've never thought about before. So let's just give the best thoughts we can to each other. And then let's get on with the conversation because that's what your three years, I think that's what I've heard from all the students really. Your, your time here is just an extended conversation about stuff that you're interested in. And let that be something that begins at the start. And we're not gonna scold you for, you know, not having had thoughts that are as developed at the beginning as they will be at the end. It is a journey, as Corin said, it's a kind of progression from that beginning. So give of your best at every stage. But, you know, as long as you are doing that, we are going to be so happy to be engaging with you um, and giving our best, hopefully, back to you as well. Yeah, uh, for me too. I think you can get really distracted and feel that the essay is the thing and it should be perfect and your tutor is going to go, well, you've missed the X, Y and Z out. Like, how could you possibly, you know, do this? It, 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 it's a process, right? You come with a tutorial essay and that's the jumping off point for our discussions. This is where it starts. So it's not kind of the sum of everything you've done on that topic. It's part, it's contributing to the discussion that we will have and the process of learning about that topic. It's not the end point. Yeah, I concur. I don't know. Um, ooh, maybe I can't speak. Can I speak? Am yeah, I... we can hear you. We can You're hear you. Right. Yeah. Um, I moved laptop, so I'm hoping it's still streaming. If it wasn't, I'm sure someone would have said something. <laughs> so my, my laptop, laptop's okay again. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's a learning process, and I think the the thing to say is that those essays we will give you feedback on them, but they are not marked, right? As opposed to many of the other courses where every single essay you submit will be partly marked and will be part of um, what's being submitted and be part of your end grade. And that's that's not the case. We use it as a teaching tool. Um, so I, there's a, a strange question um, to me. What, what would you say is the best indicator that you aren't just interested in psychology, but want to pursue it as a career? It's very hard to see, again, our, our degree as a career, because really it's, it's this kind of fundamental basis rather than um, a vocational degree that you're doing. Um, so I think you should start with being interested in psychology for psychology's sake, if you want to do psychology. Um, and then many career options come from it. It goes in such a wide range. Um, maybe some of the students can think of maybe they've changed what they thought they were going to do when they first started the course so, and now are thinking coming towards the end actually I might do something else. So Corin. Yeah no I've, I've um yeah I've definitely I think that was my focus when I applied. I remember thinking so far ahead going what do I want to do for a career it can't be just what I want to study now what, what am I going to be doing in 20 years and I think that was probably the wrong approach although that's probably wise um mine's definitely changed I was far more research focused um throughout the first two years and then now I'm only in my final year I really decided that actually clinical could be a really good approach for me and that's what I'm kind of looking at um in my like year off that's following from now so yeah, I would say get involved with the, the career service when you come to Oxford, if you do, and explore different career options and know the fact that they are all, there's lots of options. So don't think that that's the main thing at this moment. Just focus on your passion for the subject. Lena, um, you're also final year. What's, what's, yeah. what's your plans and have they changed from when you started? Um, yeah, they definitely have. Uh, sort of I came in um, with a more like humanities focus and in school I was always sort of more in the like, creative direction um so I would have never thought that like neuroscience was just one of my favorite subjects I just like loved it I thought it was great um it was just like a requirement we had to do in second year and I don't think I would have chosen it but um that's quite nice about the second year requirements in psychology is that they kind of like Corin has mentioned before they give you like a breadth and you have to sort of dip your toes into all the or a variety of bits of psychology um and you can realize that you like something that you weren't expecting. Um, and I, yeah, I think that's really good about it. And I guess with regards to the question that originally was posed about to show that you're not just interested in psychology, but that you wanna make it a career. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't think that's really what's being evaluated in students. So you don't have to show that you wanna go on to be a psychologist at all. 
So don't worry about that. And now, Eljo, you're in first year. So I don't know if your views have changed across the space of 12 months at all. No, I'm still very much in the, the boat where I'm, I'm not quite sure what I want to do as a career specifically, but I'm just interested in psychology. So I applied to do it at university. So really, I'm still in that progression stage of finding out what I want to do in the future. But I will say that um, uh, I am still looking at the research side of things, and I'm looking forward to the third year where we will be doing a research project. And then that will probably decide what I want to do in the future, whether if I enjoy it, then I might still pursue a research career, or if I don't enjoy it, then I might look at something else, that, or I might find something else interesting during uh, my time here at Oxford. Yeah, to, um, to add to that, I know some people asked on the on Slido about um, experience while you're at Oxford, because I know some other universities might offer a, like a placement year. Um, so you have a year off working in industry or working in research, and that's not a part of, of the Oxford course. So you get that final year research project, which is an amazing experience. But in terms of if you wanted to go into clinical or if you wanted to go into research, getting that additional experience is kind of up to you during probably during your time off during the summer or over Christmas, et cetera. So I think that's quite important for people to, to know, but there are so many options out there. I did a summer internship, both in the summer of my first year and in my second year, and they were, they were amazing experience. So, but that's kind of something extra that you have to do. That doesn't come alongside the course in the first and second year, especially. Yeah, thanks for addressing that. I saw that popping up as well, actually. Um, good. So I think um, this brings us to a close for the morning session, actually. Um, so thank you so much for everybody for joining and listening to us, but also for everybody who's contributed uh, in making this happen. So we'll be here again tomorrow, half 10 till 12 with uh, Dave and won't be Louise this time, but be Mary, right, for linguistics uh -huh. um, uh, and some of our students. And I'm hoping maybe some of you tune in this afternoon, two till three, uh, where we'll have um, much more about the student experience specifically. And uh, you won't hear uh, as much from, uh, from us uh, as the tutors. And you get to talk uh, more to the students. So please do submit your questions. That's where we get them from. Um, that's it. Um, I'm going to sign off and I'm going to end this stream. So um, bye, guys. bye from all of us. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. I think I've